Are we live? Yes. I think we're on. I'm not sure if we've started. Are we going? Okay, let's just jump right in. Hello on Diagnostics. This is hosted by the World Hepatitis Alliance. My name is Greg Martin. I'm a specialist registrar in public health here in Ireland. I'm also the editor-in-chief of the journal Globalization and Health. So first off, just a quick big thank you to the World Hepatitis Alliance for hosting this, uh, this webinar on this very important topic. Uh, viral hepatitis, we all know that it kills about one and a half million people every year. Ten years ago, this was conspicuously absent from the Global Health Dialogue, and the World Health, uh, sorry, the, the, the World Hepatitis Alliance has really turned that dialogue around and made this into a high-profile disease. Uh, and so a big thank you to them and a well done for the great work that they're doing. We're going to jump right in and I'm going to ask the panel members and also a big thank you to them for participating. I'm going to ask them to quickly introduce themselves. We've got people from Try, from Find, from the WHA, um, and who else have we got? And uh, Try and Find, WH and the WHO, of course. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Raquel. Raquel, can you quickly tell us who you are and where you are and what you're about? Sure, sure. Thank you so much for doing this, Greg. I really appreciate to have you host this webinar. So my name is Raquel Peck. I'm the CEO of the World Hepatitis Alliance and very much you know, appreciate the fact that we have all such great experts today with us. And I am dialing in from London. Okay, brilliant. And next up, Anita. Hi there, my name is Anita Sands. I'm working in Geneva, uh, Switzerland, uh, at the World Health Organization. And I'm working in a team that focuses on the quality of diagnostics and specifically we're called pre-qualification of diagnostics. And I'm very happy to be here today. Okay. Thanks very much, Anita. Next up, Gillian. Hi, I'm Gillian Sachs. I'm currently in New York uh, and I work on CHI's laboratory services team and we're focused on increasing access to diagnostics for various infectious diseases and most recently, viral hepatitis is now included. Thanks very much, Julian. And next, and last but not least, Elina. Okay, I think Elina might be on mute. Um, Sorry, my name is Elina. In the meantime, and oh, here she is. Okay, we've got her. She's back. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, my name is Elena, and I'm working at Find in Geneva. I'm currently in Boston. And um, I'm working on uh, hepatitis C program at Find. Okay, thanks very much. And just a quick reminder to those of you that are watching live, you can use the software, the webinar software, to send questions. We'll get those questions, and during 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 the episode, we're going to pose those questions to the panel members. So please feel free to participate. Uh, if you're not watching this live, if you're watching this sometime in the future, sorry, you can't send questions, but I'm sure you can get in touch with each of the panel members uh, and send questions individually. Um, I'm going to ask Raquel. Raquel, could you jump right in and give us a little bit of an introduction and, and, and set the scene for the rest of the webinar? Sure. Um, let me just uh, move this slide here, just if I can. So what's a webinar without IT issues? Oh, there we go. Great. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Um, let me just uh, quickly start just by giving a very very brief overview of um, hepatitis B and C and why we're doing what we're doing today. So viral hepatitis B and C, massive global public health threat, 400 million people affected. Um, as you mentioned, Greg, you know, killing more than HIV, 1.5 million in total, um, seventh global leading cause of death. And what happens is, is those two viruses, they attack your liver and it can lead to cirrhosis, liver cancer, and potentially death. Now, the problem is massive and yet it had been largely neglected until very recently. So last year, we had a mention in the SDGs, which was a fantastic achievement, and our community really seeing hepatitis as a priority, finally. And only last month, uh, we saw 194 governments commit to eliminating viral hepatitis by 2030. Now, that's in 14 years. It's very ambitious, given where we are now. Um, it's a fantastic achievement, and I think a lot has to be said about um, the role that civil society played. And in a way, the reason why we're doing this webinar today is because for you, um, or for us, to really see improvement um, on the ground, so actually taking the commitment on paper from governments and, and seeing proper elimination, we massive scaling up of interventions. And that includes testing. So if I just can go to my next slide. I think I tried, didn't really work. It's just... Try again. 
Um, oh, brilliant, thank you. So one of the major challenges here in the diagnostics, only 5% of people have been diagnosed um, so far, and in low in low income settings, that's less than 1%. The goal is 90% diagnosis by 2030. Again, 14 years, we need to up from 5 to 90. And these are the challenges that we have right now. So in a majority of countries, um, the services testing for testing really fail. Um, surveillance prog programs are basically non-existent. Lab capacity is poor. The diagnostic assets and uh, algorithm, algorithms are really costly, so pricing is an issue. It's complex, um, limited patient and community engagement, and I don't want this to be a downer, obviously, I and mean, that's why we're doing it. It would be great to hear from the other experts what's being done, and really, we, we very much believe that knowledge is power, so hopefully this webinar will help our members, um, empower our members, so we can really do some more advocacy on the ground. Thanks. Uh, just a quick introduction, because I, too, am really looking forward to hearing from the experts. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Raquel. It's safe to say that those very ambitious goals that have been set is in no small part to a lot of the work that's been done by the WHA. So a big credit to you guys for your incredible work. Okay, we're going to jump, we're going to carry on, and I'm going to ask Anita from the WHO prequal team if she can tell us a little bit about prequalification and diagnostics in the area of hepatitis. Anita, over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Greg. So as uh, Raquel just alluded to, uh, the WHO uh, has a yearly meeting with all of the ministers of health of all of the governments, that's 194 governments that come together to tell WHO what we should be doing. Uh, one of our main roles is to provide normative guidance to countries and the recent resolution of the World Health Assembly passed around um, the fight against viral hepatitis was something that really was a very important part of the process which we need in order to move governments as well as those in the private sector uh, forward in the increasing access, particularly to testing. So we're talking a lot about testing today. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that WHO has done and some of the work we are doing to increase access to testing. We actually are currently working on a set of consolidated testing guidelines that are specifically for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. I have here uh, photographs actually of the, the two previous sets of guidelines which um, have come out in the last two years which are much more related to the treatment aspects and there's a separate webinar that the World Hepatitis Alliance is actually going to have on um, access to medicines. So often um, it's very easy to decide what medicine, what treatment, but often it's hard to access and identify those people who would most benefit from, from, from treatment. So the aim of the guidelines, which as I said are in their very last part of the draft, um, and they're due to be released in the coming uh, months. The aim is to, as we said, increase access to testing for hepatitis B and C. So it's split into a few different sections. Who to test, how to test, uh, when to start treatment, and how to tell if the treatment's been effective. And this is particularly important for hepatitis C. As we know, there are new direct acting antiviral agents which actually can provide a cure for hepatitis C. It's an enormous advancement in the field and actually has really stimulated the diagnostics field as well. So we're looking at also where testing can take place. Traditionally, viral hepatitis has been the domain of the laboratories. However, we have other diseases such as malaria and HIV that have successfully taken testing outside of the laboratory to the point of care in order to expand access to populations that really would benefit most from testing. So in terms of the content of the guidelines, we do talk a little bit in terms of strategies. What is a strategy for testing for hepatitis C? And I'll go through hepatitis C first and then hepatitis B. And this is actually trying to condense a 300-page document into two slides, so do bear with me, and it's not completely um, as important as it should be. But the first step is to detect HCV infection. Have you ever been exposed to the HCV virus? And to do that, we uh, do a sort of test that actually looks for your antibody, for, for the body's response to the virus itself. It's a cheaper way to do it, um, and it's actually one of a, a very, a very um, well-known uh, serological technique that's been used for many years for all sorts of diseases. Uh, unfortunately, detecting antibodies alone doesn't tell you if you have been um, treated and you have resolved infection or if you have active infection that requires treatment. So you need a second step, a second sort of test that will diagnose um, active infection of hep C and at this time we're actually really looking for the virus itself or a component of the virus such as a core antigen. 
This is probably normally a more expensive test. In the past, it's a more complicated and sophisticated test. So we're working with manufacturers to make simpler, easier, more robust tests that can be taken to the point of care. So you can detect HCV exposure and diagnose active infection and need for a treatment in the one visit. And then, of course, at some point later, maybe two, three months down the track after the treatment course has um, been taken, then confirming if treatment actually worked. Is one cured? So again, we're trying to actually prove that there's no virus, so absence of the virus is what we're looking for there. And that's a basic, um, in a nutshell, how we look at um, testing for hepatitis C. For hepatitis B, um, my next slide, we actually also are looking for, uh, sorry, I'll just try to get this slide. We also have a, a, a bit of a conundrum uh, in that we have um, markers in the body when you have acquired hepatitis. Sometimes you might resolve hepatitis B, but sometimes it will stay on and become chronic, and that means it's persistently replicating in the body. And at this point, we look for um, an antigen that is actually a part of the, the virus itself called hepatitis B surface antigen. People might ask, why don't you look for antibodies like you do for HIV, like you do for hepatitis C? Mainly that's because of immunisation. If you're immunised against hepatitis B, you also have antibodies um, against the hepatitis virus. That's how vaccines generally work. And then as with uh, hepatitis C, we have then sequential steps to look at do you require uh, antiviral treatment, would you benefit from it? And there we actually look again for the virus itself and actually also look to see how your liver is working. Uh, so there are certain just basic laboratory tests that can look at your liver function and other sorts of tests that can look at the um, fibrosis and the amount that your liver might be hardening due to having hepatitis B. And then, of course, to see if the, if the treatment has worked and if your liver is back to being functional again. So in terms of um, other aspects of what WHO does, uh, we also, in addition to the uh, guidance that we have on how to test for HIV, and I've actually numbered this slide with numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I just talked about number 1, which is the testing strategies that you might use. WHO has another uh, activity which is called pre-qualification uh, and this is a, 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 an activity that is run in uh, a similar way to how we look at medicines and how we look at vaccines where we assess the quality of tests to see if they should be used um, and obviously poor quality tests might not need to be used. And so uh, it's a little bit of a complicated slide but it's just to kind of illustrate there are a number of moving parts and when we're trying to recommend to countries how best to test for hepatitis C and B, it's a matter of testing strategies, it's a matter of selecting a good quality product, procuring that product, which is step four, um, quality assurance at the end user site, which is step five, and then some other aspects related to the product of post-market surveillance. I'll move on now to talk a little bit about what is pre-qualification. Oh, I think I might have slipped, skipped a few slides. Um, okay, sorry. So in terms of um, the main aspect of pre-qualification is, as we said, to look at the performance and the quality of the test. And one of the best ways to, um, best ways to assess the performance of a test is a, a concept known as sensitivity and the specificity. The sensitivity is the ability of a test, so maybe, maybe it's a rapid test for hep C antibodies, to identify if that person um, as positive or truly is positive. Um, it's sort of like uh, when you're going through an airport and you're being screened uh, to see if you have anything in your bag. Those tests have very high sensitivity. They're trying to find anybody who might possibly have a nail file or scissors or a can of liquid in their, in their uh, luggage. And as you know, maybe nine times out of ten you get screened out that people might say, oh, I think there's something there. They'll then go and look much more closely and find that you didn't have anything there. So sensitivity is a really a measure of how good is a test at ruling in everybody who potentially has, let's say, hepatitis C antibodies. The converse of that is specificity. It's how good is the test at telling you that you don't have hepatitis C antibodies or that you don't have um, a nail file in your, in your hand luggage, for example. So it's very much looking at um, this concept of false positivity. How many false positives would this test give you? Obviously a false positive can be distressing to the patient because until you go and confirm whether that is actually true or not, you might think that you have a disease that will potentially lead to such serious complications as cirrhosis and liver cancer. So it's really important that you choose a test that has high sensitivity, 
and high specificity. Unfortunately, in life, things are generally a dichotomy, and sometimes you need to trade high sensitivity for high specificity and vice versa. We also look at things such as stability of the tests. Very often, as you know, you might buy a carton of milk. It says you must drink it before such and such date. It says it on the side of the carton. How do you actually know um, whether that is it can be drunk in one month or in two months or in three months? So we actually look at that aspect of the test. And that's really important in low-income settings where uh, and low-throughput low settings where um, tests are bought on an annual basis to be distributed to testing sites. Okay, just trying to get to the next slide, uh, which is just sorry, taking a little bit longer. It's actually my last slide, so if I can just get to that. Okay, there we have it. Okay, and just to talk a little bit about what is WHO pre-qualification. So this is actually a schematic of what we do, but basically WHO pre-qualification is a way in which we take those concepts of sensitivity and specificity and we apply an approach similar to what the European Union does or the FDA does um, to evaluate the performance and the quality of tests. Um, we split that into three different sections, into a dossier review, a site inspection, and an independent performance evaluation. Uh, and these are very much the similar sort of way that medicines and vaccines are also assessed to see if they meet good quality standards. Somehow I've skipped around. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll just leave it on that slide. Um, and so once WHO has found a product to meet pre-qualification uh, requirements, we then work with our partners in the UN, so we work with UNICEF, work with the United Nations uh, Family Fund and Population Fund, and we work with manufacturers to agree on a price per test. Then we provide that to countries and they can use that as a way to bargain for negotiated prices, preferably a bit lower than the price that we might get. And then we as WHO work together with manufacturers and with the testing programs to make sure that there are no issues with the test once it goes out into the market at large scale, um, and so we do that through post-market surveillance. Uh, we also work with manufacturers if they make changes to the product to make sure that we reassess them and then relist those products. So that's just a quick run through of some of the programs that we're showing. Some of them are quite normative, quite policy based, and some of them like pre-qualification are really quite technical and we're really trying to fill a, a niche there where regulatory authorities are a little bit less used to how they should deal with hepatitis diagnostics. Uh, and so I will leave it there and I'll hand back to Greg. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Anita, I might ask you one or two questions quickly because I think pre-qualification is sometimes something that people find a little bit confusing and I, I, I find it confusing so if we can get me to understand it, we can get anyone to understand it. Um, yeah. So essentially, if I understand things correctly, the one, the pre, let's firstly just establish that we're talking about diagnostics and if I understand correctly, tell me if I'm wrong, that with, in most countries, especially middle income and, and low income countries, the regulatory authorities tend to be weaker in the area of regulation and licensing around diagnostics than they would be for medicines. Am I, am I right in that statement? Uh, yeah, I think you would be right. I think um, we've done a lot of great work with medicines and vaccines and the diagnostics has been a little bit of the, the Cinderella story, the little sister in the side of the room. Uh, and so it's very true to say that a country may have good regulatory practice for medicines but not yet have that fully developed for IVDs. That's, that's absolutely the case and that's really why we're doing what we're doing. And I suppose that's the point that I was just about to make is this, this to me this seems where the real strength of the WHO pre-qualification program fits in, in that where countries may not have the internal regulatory mechanisms that are needed to have uh, vigilant licensing processes for diagnostics in their country, they may not just have the capacity. You know, not all of the countries have an FDA or a medic medicines and healthcare product regulatory agency like the UK. They would then lean very heavily on the efficacy and effectiveness and safety uh, 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 inspections that the World Health Organization would undertake for pre-qualification. So in a sense, you're undertaking a process on behalf of the countries. Am I Am I more or less getting it right? Yeah, you're actually quite right. And in fact, we have a separate World Health Resolution that talks about access to medical products um, and around this concept of pre-qualification. As I said, it's something we, 
we subscribe to across all health products, medicines, vaccines and diagnostics, but it certainly is uh, to, in response to countries' requests, they would like to know how, how they can bring hepatitis C and hepatitis B products into the market. They want good quality products that are safe, that perform well, and they do use aspects of our assessment. I talked about a dossier review, a site inspection, and the laboratory evaluation. So the data of these um, uh, assessments is actually made publicly available once a product's pre-qualified and countries can indeed use that data to, to help make their own decisions about market entry. Okay, brilliant. And then my, my last question is a bit of a loaded question because I think I know the answer. But if I were a UN agency and I was wanting to procure products on behalf of a country, would I need those products to be pre-qualified by the WHO in order to make that procurement? Yes, you would. Yes, you would. And you could contact either ourselves here in WHO or UNICEF. UNICEF is really the, the strong leader in procurement in the UN. And yes, they only purchase pre-qualified products. Okay, I actually have one last question for you, but it's a bit of a, a cheeky one, so you don't have to answer this, because maybe you can't. Sure. Uh, is there anything in the pipeline at the moment coming through pre-qualification that we should be excited about in the area of diagnostics for hepatitis? Uh, yes. There actually is. Um, we have, uh, we're working on some rapid tests for hepatitis C, so rapid tests that could be used really out in the field, even in the community, right? So you don't even need to be a healthcare worker to conduct a test. You could be sitting in a community setting. So we have hopefully a product coming through in the next month or so. And we're also working with a manufacturer of a molecular product. And that molecular product is the one that you would use to determine if you have active HCV infection. They actually already have a HIV product, which has just been pre-qualified, and we're hoping very, very soon to have that product uh, also pre-qualified. So watch this space in the next few months. We should hopefully have one product for both of those um, parts of the strategy. Okay, that's terrific, and I'm glad you brought up sort of point of care diagnostics because the next person that's going to talk to us is Gillian from Chai. I used to work at Chai, so I happen to know that Chai is obsessed with point of care. They love it because it's really okay. important and it takes diagnostics to the place where it's needed most. So, Gillian, can I ask you to jump right in and talk about the work of the Clinton Health Access Initiative in the area of diagnostics of hepatitis? Sure thing. So, I will try to take over the slides. Great. So, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Again, I'm Gillian Sachs and I, I work on CHI's Access Program. Um, and I'd like to begin by briefly introducing our organization, where we work, and how we operate. So um, CHI's Access Program is active in over 25 countries in Africa and Asia. Um, and we also facilitate affordable procurement of drugs and diagnostics in an even greater number of lower and middle income countries across various healthcare programs. And most recently, we've added viral hepatitis to our portfolio. So when we speak of access, uh, our efforts are focused on the following five points. We aim for our health systems to provide the right products at the right price, in the right quantities, in the right places, at the right time. So to do this, um, Chai works on both um, demand and supply side of the market. Just trying to get to my next slide. I went a little too far, but um, briefly I'll just say that, um, right, so we work on both the demand and the supply side, and the reason we do this is we'd like to make uh, more effective technologies available at affordable prices while ensuring market efficiency, transparency, and predictability. Um, and we believe by working on both sides that we can accomplish our goals faster. So um, I'd like to just briefly uh, elaborate upon some of the um, topics that Anisha Anisha, Anita touched upon um, in terms of where laboratory tests typically are performed versus where patients typically access care. So um, CHI generally operates in countries that have tiered public health systems, um, and I illustrated this in the graphic shown here. So at the highest level um, and present in the fewest number are referral hospitals, um, and these hospitals are generally staffed by specialized healthcare providers um, and they're well equipped to provide complex laboratory-based testing. 
And then as you go down through the system to lower tiers, you'll have available fewer specialized health care workers and you'll have less infrastructure. Um, such that when you get down to the health center level, um, though these are available in the most, uh, are, are most numerous in healthcare systems, um, and they are where most patients will seek care, there's uh, limited availability to perform complex testing. Um, and so because of this imbalance, um, you can see that you, we might need to come together to come up with some solutions to address these, uh, this imbalance. So um, previously, drug regimens and diagnostic testing requirements for AHCV were quite complicated, um, and any care, if any, in lower and middle income countries was restricted to the top of this pyramid. Um, and if we're to achieve the goals that Raquel laid out for us in the beginning, um, we believe strongly that we need to de decentralize diagnostics and care as far down the pyramid as possible. Um, and one approach to doing this are point of care technologies. So these are technologies which have been developed um, and can work in more limited resource settings. So for example, it might be a machine that can operate under battery power so that if it's at a health center that is intermittent electricity, the machine can still function. Additionally, we can use simple tests such as rapid test kits. So for HIV, for malaria, and also for HCV, we have rapid test kits that can be performed at the lowest level of care. Um, and so uh, additionally, when you do need a complex testing, uh, what CHAI works on as well as other organizations um, is we help to uh, strengthen sample transport networks such that when patients present at lower levels in the healthcare system, samples can be collected from them and then those samples are referred up to the more complex settings. So you don't need patients to travel but rather the sample is, tra is transported. So I'd now like to just briefly um, review some country level data that shows um, how some of these systems challenges have impacted diagnostic rates for HCV. So in the graph on the left, uh, the purple bars show the rates of HCV diagnosis in various countries um, from 2013 and 2014, and the green squares show treatment rates in those same countries. Um, and what I'd like to draw your attention to is that the rates of diagnosis in lower middle income and upper middle income countries are generally much lower than the average diagnostic rates in high income countries. And we believe that most of this is due to high prices and also due to the, some of the systems um, challenges that I just mentioned. Additionally, um, we can all recognize that the first step in placing someone on treatment would be diagnosing them. So the graph on the right shows diagnostic rate um, on the x-axis and treatment rate on the y-axis. And I think what you can appreciate is that there's a bit of a correlation Countries that have high diagnostic rates generally have higher treatment rates. And so I think that this strongly supports the rationale for ensuring that access to diagnostics um, is prioritized to ensure the maximum number of patients can be initiated on treatment. So given this background, um, I would just like to briefly introduce CHI's specific uh, HCV programs. So we're currently supporting seven countries uh, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Rwanda in Africa, and India, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Indonesia in Asia. Um, and we're working with our partner governments to um, uh, basically generate evidence that shows that uh, care and treatment can be scaled up um, in the lower middle income country setting. Jillian, if I just may interrupt you for a second, because I noticed that yeah, um, Ethiopia and Re Rwanda there is, and it's very interesting because when I was mentioning earlier about um, poor lab capacity, etc., we heard recently that Ethiopia was sending samples um, of their testing to be processed um, to Germany. So it's different. That, that's it was, correct. And to us, it didn't really make any sense what was happening there. So that's correct. So previously, um, there was no in-country laboratory capacity to do HCV viral load testing or genotyping and previous treatment regimens um, required genotyping. So yes, the patients generally in the private sector were sending samples to labs in Germany and then the results were being sent back to Ethiopia. Um, but I can happily report that uh, there are platforms in Ethiopia's public sector that can certainly run HCV viral load tests um, and that will no longer be uh, what they need to do in the public sector. 
Oh, great. And my la la last comment, perhaps, in this, because we wonder another thing that we heard, um, and to um, make reference to what Anita said about stability before. Um, um, on on that, we we heard that the government came across um, a bunch of tests that tests that were going to expire this summer. Is this gossip? Do you know anything about it? You've been in touch with the Rwandan government. <laughs> uh, I can say that Rwanda is currently undergoing um, a pretty wide screening effort uh, for their people living with HIV to screen them for both hepatitis B and C, uh, which I think is a great effort since. Um, this community of people generally uh, accesses care in the healthcare system. They're already engaged. Um, and so I think uh, it's a, it presented a great opportunity for Rwanda to, to really figure out who has HCV in their community um, and what the rates of HCV and HPV infection are. So that screening activity, I believe, is well underway. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, so to support these seven countries, um, maybe I can get to my next slide. Um, yes, so um, to support our seven countries, we are working to address major bottlenecks um, for program launch and scale up. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the specific activities that I think are most relevant to our conversation today. So to ensure that the appropriate policy frameworks are in place, we're developing country level treatment guidelines uh, based, around some, based around simplified testing and treatment. Um, we're developing realistic cost and operational plans for governments so that they can launch their programs. Additionally, we're strengthening um, the quality of care by um, building facility level capacity. So to do this, we're training healthcare workers in HCV prevention, screening, diagnosis, and treatment. And we're developing m and &E tools um, that can integrate into existing country systems. Um, and again, when I say we, I, I really mean that we're working with governments to do this. So um, it's not CHAI that's providing all of this. It's really the we're helping uh, improve systems in the public health care setting. Um, uh, we additionally are um, ensuring treatment and diagnostic supply availability um, by encouraging and expediting national registration processes, um, identifying procurement channels, promoting uh, appropriate order placement, and doing commodity forecasting. Um, and then additionally, uh, to build treatment and diagnostic networks. We work to map current treatment and laboratory capacity and then look to develop plans that leverage existing networks as well as uh, recommend the building of new networks if necessary for screening, diagnosis, and treatment. Um, we support country test selection and we promote the uptake of novel technologies. Um, and I'd just like to highlight the fact that a lot of these activities are somewhat disease agnostic and therefore though we're focused on HCV right now, a lot of the gains that we um, make can be leveraged probably for to strengthen care for HPV in the future. Um, and as Anita mentioned, the, the new all oral anti-HCV treatments um, are curative and they also enable simpler and fewer diagnostic requirements. So some of the consequences of this is that because there are fewer lab tests needed to initiate treatment, um, we see that fewer patients can be lost to follow up between initial diagnosis and treatment initiation. Um, additionally, uh, because we are now simplifying the decision process around the selection of treatment, we can despecialize the provision of HCV care, and thus patients can actually seek care at lower tiers in the health system. So, again, working to decentralize care. Um, and then, lastly, these drugs have less toxicity, so there's limited need to. Uh, look at uh, complex monitoring, which would require laboratory infrastructure during treatment. Um, and this sort of has two uh, consequences. One is, again, um, less specialized healthcare cadres can manage patients. Um, and additionally, we place less of a burden on um, somewhat already overloaded laboratory systems. So collectively, we believe that by um, simplifying and requiring fewer diagnostic requirements, it is now feasible for lower middle income countries to uh, access curative treatment for HCV. Um, and then just to close, um, I would like to highlight uh, the importance of um, activism and, and advocacy in ensuring access to diagnostics. 
Uh, I'm trying to get to my next slide, apologies. I don't think there's any webinar exists I, the, I, anyway that I'm aware of without IT issues, as I mentioned before. Right. <laughs> oh, there we go. So, um, lastly, I, basically, I just wanted to reinforce the fact that um, advocacy and activism at many levels, so at the policy level, at the healthcare system level, and at the population level, um, are really important to demand access to HCV diagnostics now that we have curative treatment. And I've just listed um, some uh, recommended approaches that one could take. So thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Gillian. And uh, let me just say that, of course, we all know that CHI has got a strong history in the area of improving access to medicines and diagnostics across a range of diseases. Uh, Gillian, I've got a quick question for you. When we talk about the cascade or the access cascade, uh, my question is going to be where along the access cas cascade do you think that there are weaknesses in country programs that need additional support and just for those of you that aren't that familiar with the sort of access to medicines and diagnostics lingo by cascade I mean everything from product development, licensing, demand forecasting, product selection, procurement, shipping, warehousing, distribution, inventory management, rational use, all of the bits and pieces that need to be in place in order for a product that that's been developed by a manufacturer to be used by an end user. So along that cascade, is there a uh, that you're aware of or that, I mean, I'm sure Chai is working on a number of these, but perhaps something that needs additional attention that's getting not what it should uh, at this point in time? To be fair, I think because um, the HCV field is moving so quickly, so the technologies and the drugs that we were using just two years ago are now different. Um, so I think the market is moving very, very quickly. And so we at Chai are kind of focused on every single aspect that you just mentioned. Um, and I think uh, one really key uh, issue that we're focused on is really since most HCV care has been in the high income setting, we really need to show to manufacturers on the diagnostic and the drug side um, that though we know that so many people have HCV or HPV, that uh, care and treatment programs can actually be implemented in these lower middle income countries um, and sustained at, at, by governments. Since um, unlike HIV or TB or malaria, there are not big donors who will be funding these activities. And so it really relies, uh, it really lies to the governments to, uh, to show they're, um, they're engaged and that they're committed to tackling these problems. Okay, and uh, one last question. When country programs do their demand forecasting and product selection for diagnostics, uh, one of the challenges very often in, in, a, in a lot of diseases is making sure that they are ordering or procuring drugs, or they're pro procuring diagnostics uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a quantity that's appropriate for their capacity to provide treatment. Is that challenging in the area of, of hepatitis? Uh, given the fact that there's new treatments available, but they're expensive and they're not always available, you know, they're not always easy to buy. Um, so is, is the demand forecasting and the procurement of diagnostics being bottlenecked by a lack of capacity to provide treatment for people that get a positive diagnosis? Um, I think historically I would agree with you that that is what has been going on. And, um, but I think moving forward, um, there, we almost have the opposite effect, whereby because there are such new great drugs available and uh, generic drugs are imminently going to be available that are high quality, um, so that are going through the pre-qualification process, um, and it should be available in more affordable uh, prices. Um, the focus has really been on that, and I think the, the diagnostics now need to catch up to say, okay, if we now have these drugs available, can we find the patients that we need to put them on treatment? So it's almost the reverse is happening. Okay, so treatment availability is driving demand for diagnostics. That's very interesting. I think so. That's exactly right. Nice to see. You. Okay, thanks very much, Julian. Okay, next up, Elena Thank from you. Find. Can you talk to us? Great. Thank you. Um, just try to move to my slide. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about Find and our hepatitis C program. So I just to briefly introduce you to FIND. FIND is, stands for Foundation of Innovative New Diagnostics and uh, was, uh, has been started in 2003 
the global goal of SNAP find is to fight the diseases of poverty, and we are doing that by focusing on diagnostics. Um, so the diagnosis, the, the, um, the majority of diseases of poverty lack the uh, efficient diagnostic solutions, which are necessary to enable all diseases and for elimination and eradication of the diseases, and find acts as a bridge between experts in technology development, policy, and clinical care reduces barriers for innovation and effective implementation of diagnostic solutions in low- and middle-income countries. Um, FIND has four um, main strategic pillars, which are um, first uh, catalyze the development by identifying the needed diagnostic solutions and removing the barriers for their development. And second is guide use and inform policy um, to lead products through the clinical trials pathway to global policy on use and market entry. Um, then it's accelerating access uh, by, uh, by um, giving support for uptake and appropriate use of diagnostics to achieve health impact and shaping an agenda uh, to improve the understanding of the value of diagnostics and strengthen the commitment uh, for funding. Uh, FIND has uh, different diseases programs and working on tuberculosis, malaria, uh, neglected tropical diseases, and most recently on HIV and hepatitis. Hepatitis is a fairly uh, new program started last year, and uh, um, the overall goal of it is, of course, to enable a world free of hepatitis C. Uh, we do, um, the five-year goal is to support a hepatitis program uh, in reducing transmission, morbidity, and mortality, and reduce the socioeconomic impact of viral hepatitis at individual, community, and populational levels. And the strategy, uh, strategy objectives are enable affordable and fit-for-purpose diagnostics, enable an access to these diagnostic solutions and um, support the prevention of infection and demonstrate the need and benefit of intervention for hepatitis C. Um, to go to my next slide. Oops. Okay, so as um, Julian and Anita already described, that um, the diagnostic algorithm for hepatitis C, which used to be a very complex and multi-step process is now undergoing a substantial simplification um, with an access to new and very efficient drugs. Many steps are not needed anymore. And uh, in the midterm, uh, the diagnostic algorithm can be uh, the diagnostic of the infection and uh, determine, determine the stage of fibrosis and putting patients on cure and making a, a test of cure to confirm the efficiency of treatment. Um, and it, it, sorry, next slide. So the diagnosis uh, for Hep C is a two-step procedure, as Anita described already. At first, uh, the patient is um, uh, tested for the presence of HCV antibodies, and the positive results for HCV antibodies doesn't mean that the person is uh, HCV, uh, we have an negative disease, so the, the positive uh, patients have to be uh, tested for the presence of the viral particle, and these tests are um, done in central uh, hospital settings. It, it depends on uh, a rather strong lab infrastructure and um, uh, technically trained staff. And therefore, in low- and middle-income countries, many people don't have an access for, for this, and there is a lot of um, loss to follow up, and many people uh, do not uh, go for confirmatory testing after obtaining the results of serology testing. Um, in the near future, it, these two steps of, um, antibody, of, of screening and confirming can be merged into one, and uh, because in the pipeline, uh, there are some platforms uh, which, um, for tests that can be performed at point of care uh, settings, uh, decentralized, where most of the people uh, would seek um, uh, care, and uh, um, and those tests would be uh, would detect the uh, viremia, so the presence of the virus viral particles in the blood directly, 
and uh, so uh, one test will be needed to um, understand whether the, the patient is uh, HCV infected and needs treatment or not. And the treatment decision can be uh, taken timely and in decentralized settings. So uh, we are currently, uh, what we do to, uh, to make it happen, to make this um, one-step diagnostic solution possible, is we define the need of, um, we define what kind of product uh, the countries need and uh, this we do by consultation with key stakeholders and uh, we um, do the analysis and uh, um, summarize all the technical and uh, performance and operational characteristics of the needed product in so-called target product profiles. These target product profiles would guide manufacturers in developing the diagnostic solutions which would be fit for purpose and which is needed in low and middle income countries. We do also the, uh, we uh, see what is in the pipeline, what, what tests are under development and what platforms exist and which uh, of them can be um, potentially used for um, HCV diagnostics and we would uh, approach the manufacturers or the manufacturers would approach us and uh, uh, we would explain them what, would, uh, what are the market opportunities and would stimulate them to work on the development of those tests. Um, we partner with some of the manufacturers and add them, uh, we support them uh, by providing funding and providing uh, expert consultancies and uh, helping them to organize clinical trials and helping them to implement eventually their diagnostic solutions in the target countries. And um, this is I, I would like to finish and thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Alina. Um, I just have a, I have a quick question, and perhaps other members of the panel may have questions as well for each other. So I'll give people an opportunity to think of their questions while I'm asking this one. Uh, Alina, in the area of hepatitis, when we talk about hepatitis B, looking at the serology and the tests that are available, it's quite easy to distinguish between acute or recently diagnosed hepatitis B and chronic hepatitis B. And from a public health point of view, when we identify a case of acute hepatitis B, our response is a little bit different and we make more effort to try and identify uh, the exposure that might, might have caused that and, and of course because it's acute the person may have a higher viremic load so we'll go to more effort to ensure that there isn't onward spread from that person by giving them advice etc etc. That's not the case with hepatitis C, in other words current tests don't allow for us to distinguish between acute and chronic hepatitis C. Is there anything in the pipeline that either FIND is doing or that FIND is aware of that uh, any, any, any diagnostic tests that may aid in distinguishing between acute and chronic hepatitis C? Yes, correct. That uh, for to, The only way to detect acute hepatitis C for the moment is to, um, to have a patient which was seronegative, uh, which didn't have an antibodies and then become seropositive, then meaning that they uh, become to, uh, to have uh, anti-HCV antibodies. Unfortunately, there is nothing in the in the pipeline which is specifically targeting a diagnostic of acute infection, and uh, no tests that I, I'm aware of that are being developed for okay. specifically for acute infection. No, and, I, and I thought that might be the case, but I suppose maybe this is a, a message to all the manufacturers out there, and the R&D people, and the academics at universities. Somebody, please come up with a test to help us with distinction between acute and chronic hepatitis C. Anyway, um, now, do any of the panel members or anyone in the audience have any questions that they'd like to launch at each other? Um, any additional comments like or, or statements you'd like question, to make? I'd like to launch a question, if that's okay. Greg, um, I, I'm launching a yeah, question to uh, try and find, um, because you mentioned um, Elena and uh, that, um, and, and also Gillian, that um, you work uh, with the governments for those, you know, in, in order to get the testing going and innovative solutions, etc. But um, do you work with NGOs on the ground? And I, I, I suppose that this would be something that our members watching this. We have members in about 80 countries. Um, do you work with the NGOs in any capacity and if not, is there an opportunity for collaboration even if it's for, for you to then work with governments and then tell the NGOs um, as you did in your slide, Julian, advocate for those tests and work in parallel. I just wondered if, if um, you could talk a little bit more about that. 
Sure, I can say uh, for Chai at least, our main partner is always the government, and we aim to work in uh, public health care facilities. So if um, through the government they're already engaged with particular NGOs or we come across NGOs on the ground that are doing um, activities that we think would complement the objectives of the government, we generally put those NGOs in contact with the governments um, to really ensure that, they, that their activities are aligned with uh, ministry priorities. Um, and also, if uh, NGOs are engaged at the facility level to, to support the government, then we certainly would collaborate with them. But generally, we work directly with ministries, and then the ministries have the relationship with the, with the NGOs on the ground. Thank you. And I think I think I can say that the find is, is quite similar and also if the we primarily work with governments but if there are NGOs on the ground, of course we don't want to duplicate efforts and we would collaborate with them and join the efforts to and also link them to governments. Okay, we've got a question from the audience and this is a question for Anita uh, from WHO pre qualification and that is Anita, how many pre-qualified tests currently exist, in other words, are pre-qualified from the WHO for hepatitis C virus at the moment? How many of them are available? And where would a person find more information about this? Okay, it's a good question. Uh, so for now, we only have two products pre-qualified. Unfortunately, they're both products that you require a laboratory for, and we're really working hard with those suppliers who make rapid tests to try to bring them through our pathway. Um, unfortunately, I have to say we've had a few tests that have come through that haven't made it to the other end. So we've actually uh, evaluated quite a number of tests, but only two that have come out the other end. So this is really a call to suppliers as well, and even to, to the members of the WHA, to really advocate for good quality, well performing tests, um, not just test themselves. Um, and, and so at the moment you can find those two tests that are pre-qualified on our website. I will make sure that the link is provided for you um, as part of the deck for the, the seminar. Um, but unfortunately there's a lot of tests out there for hepatitis C, uh, not so many that are good quality and that are well performed. Okay, thanks very much. Um, any other questions from any of the panel members for each other? or any other final statements, otherwise I will wrap things up. Okay, well look, firstly, thanks very much to all the panel members. Um, I've certainly learned a lot. You know, I think the take home message here is there's uh, a lot of exciting things happening in the world of hepatitis, particularly hepatitis C. We're excited about the treatments that are becoming available. Obviously, in order to get people on treatments, we need them to be diagnosed, and so it's great to see so much important work being done right across the access cascade in the area of hepatitis C. It's also good to see such a nice, diverse, uh, a range of organizations that are getting involved. So we're really seeing work being done at every level of the access ca uh, cascade for um, uh, hepatitis C virus diagnostics. So very excited about all of that. Big thank you to the panelists for, for, for their tremendous job in, in talking to us today. Thank you, of course, to the World uh, Hepatitis um, Alliance doing great work and it's, it's great to have webinars like this. A quick note that on Tuesday, the 12th of July, there's going to be a similar webinar and it's going to be focusing on access to medicines. So instead of diagnostics, we'll talk about medicines, again, in the area of hepatitis, particularly viral hepatitis. Um, thank you to everybody, and I think that's it for today. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.